Good afternoon. It's a, a tremendous pleasure for me personally to introduce Jerry Davila to you. Jerry's an old friend. We go back many, many, many years, and uh, and therefore it's uh, an added pleasure to to chair this uh, this session. For those of you who don't know, uh, Jerry Davila holds the Jorge Paulo Lehman Chair in Brazilian History at the University of Illinois and is currently the director of this university's Lehman Institute for Brazilian Studies. His research focuses on the influence of racial thought in public policy, as well as the state and social movements in the 20th century. He is the author of many, many books, among them Hotel Tropico Brazil and the Challenge of African Decolonization, which received the uh, Latin uh, Studies Association Brazil Section Book Prize, um, as well as of Diploma of Whiteness, Race and Social Policy in Brazil, published by Duke University. Um, Jerry has also been a Fulbright lecturer at the University of Sao Paulo and uh, held the uh, Fulbright Distinguished Chair in American Studies at the Catholic University in Rio de Janeiro. Not least, he's received the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship and Fulbright Hayes Research Fellowship as well. Jerry. Rosalie, thank you so much for the introduction. and. I have to stand over there? Okay. I was uh, deceived by the microphone in front of me. I will pass this under this. Thank you. Okay, okay we've successfully made the transition. <laughs> which now allows me to thank uh, the organizers uh, and Rosalie, um, as, uh, as well as uh, Stefan and Hernan, and so many of you who have been uh, really uh, significant interlocutors uh, from whom I've learned a lot over uh, many years. Uh, and in the context of uh, the thoughts that I want to share with you today about uh, ethnic nationalism and racial populism in Brazilian perspective, a couple of ideas that I want to kind of put on the table and uh, invite uh, some opportunities to uh, think through and challenge and problematize them uh, as well. And these are two concepts that I've been thinking uh, a lot about uh, recently uh, in the context of uh, the very tumultuous experience uh, of Brazil in recent years and in particular since its most recent uh, election. And in this context, uh, there's a juxtaposition which those of you who are familiar with Brazilian history or Brazilian society will find to be a very familiar one. Uh, on the one hand, uh, President and previously presidential candidate Jair Bolsonaro has made kind of conflicting uh, statements uh, that on the one hand are uh, frequently very hostile and contemptuous of immigrant groups, refugee groups in Brazil, uh, Haitians, Venezuelans, uh, Syrians, uh, West Africans, uh, as well as um, disparaging remarks of, about politi uh, politically assassinated Afro-Brazilian uh, elected officials. It's a, it's a very complicated moment. But amid this uh, rhetorical and real violence, there's also an affirmation coming from the president and others close to him that Brazil is a country uh, in which uh, racism and prejudice inherently do not exist as part of Brazil's very fabric of national identity. Uh, and so my concern uh, that I want to unpack a little bit here with you today is how these two things can coexist. What is it that puts them together, right? Um, and so this is the puzzle, right? How does um, uh, the persistent assertion that racial discrimination does not exist in Brazil stand up uh, continuously in the face of um, abundant, even limitless evidence to the contrary, and how do we understand the tension between the negation of the existence of racial discrimination and the pr presentation continuously of evidence of its existence? How do these things um, sustain this dialectical relationship uh, over time, both in the present and, uh, and in the past? So to give you an example of these ideas, uh, juxtaposing them, in this case, across 70 years to show that this is neither an old nor a new phenomenon. Um, here are uh, two uh, quotes that couldn't be more different. One by the person who's now Brazil's Vice President, Hamilton, Hamilton Mourão, uh, former Army General, 
uh, who declares in August 2018, very categorically, racial prejudice does not exist in Brazil. Uh, so you could hold this up against newspapers from 2018 that say racial prejudice exists. For our purposes, I'm holding it up against the 1950 newspaper whose headline is racial prejudice exists, right? Uh, in the face of statements identical to the ones that Modal was making in 2018 that other people are making in 1950. So first, some underlying context for this tension. Uh, anyone in Brazil who experiences racial prejudice and discrimination is completely aware that this is taking place, right? That there's, there's um, uh, no one is under any illusions that the experience that they have with racial prejudice is anything but racial prejudice. I want to complicate that for a second by saying in some cases it can be hard to distinguish what might be racial prejudice or sexism uh, or classism, right, when these things are in relationship with each other. But the existence of that relationship is something that's apparent to someone who's in this situation always in Brazil. Uh, at the same time, there's an abundance of work by uh, demographers, social scientists, intellectuals, activists, uh, people who don't even fit into these categories, uh, documenting the, the depth and extent of racial discrimination uh, in Brazilian society. Nonetheless, the ability to uh, deny the existence of racial, racism or discrimination is something that persists in the face of uh, all of this evidence. And I'd like to suggest three ways in which uh, these, these aren't exclusive of other possibilities, but three significant ways in which this idea is perpetuated. What, it, what, what is invested in the continuing belief that racial prejudice does not exist in Brazil? Uh, so first, uh, I'd suggest that this plays a, a really integral role in the particular manifestation of white privilege and white supremacism in Brazil. Uh, that the negation of the existence of prejudice is something that protects uh, a racially stratified society. This is what social scientists uh, have frequently called the prejudice of not having prejudice. Um, another is that um, this is a major moral marker to assert that Brazil is a country that does not experience racial prejudice is to place Brazil in a privileged position relative to countries that are often cited as comparisons. That is something of the United States, or you see this in South Africa. Uh, and if uh, racism or segregation or, or prejudice or discrimination, the various iterations of this phenomenon are something that can be externalized and become, may, be made synonymous to uh, an, a national identity that is a foreign national identity, it creates the possibility for uh, framing national identity in Brazil in, in a kind of a positive moral uh, framework. And then the third factor that I, um, I more and more think is critical is that Brazil is a society of, inter of frequently interrupted democratic uh, regimes. Uh, so this means several things. One of them is that it is a country that in the, the past 100 years uh, under which people have lived under five separate constitutions, um, each of which has been introduced either at the beginning or the end of an authoritarian period. Right? The capacity to consistently organize social movements is uh, something that is uh, disrupted. And not only is it disrupted, it is specifically disrupted in the experience of people mobilizing around minority rights. Uh, Afro-Brazilian groups are among the ones that are uh, the most immediately and frequently persecuted by authoritarian regimes. And uh, in part because authoritarian regimes in Brazil by their nature have tended to emphasize a national character of cordiality and harmony in which benign race relations is a, is a way of demonstrating that this is in fact a democratic society in the absence of political democracy. Now my goal here today is to look past these kind of major features of this belief structure to try to uh, explore some of the um, uh, underlying ways of thinking that help feed them. Uh, so what I'm suggesting is that, is that these are manifestations, kind of larger uh, ways of conceptualizing the nation and, uh, and Brazilian society that are, um, that are based not on, on evidence but on ideology. Uh, the two concepts that I want to work with you today 
with are the idea of ethnic nationalism and the idea of, of racial populism. So I'm going to skip this next slide and I'm going to, to jump to these. And I'm going to give you the definitions that I'm working with. And uh, these are, again, working definitions. And I, I say this in particular because I'd, I'd really like to invite your own thoughts about uh, how to conceptualize these phenomena. So ethnic nationalism is a term that wouldn't be uh, strange to uh, people working with topics that we're discussing in the course of this, uh, this conference. But in this case, I'm talking about ethnic nationalism not only in its narrowest sense, but also in its more expansive sense. The idea that, um, uh, that the nation isn't the representation of a single ethnic group, but the idea that the nation is comprised of a set of values that ethnic groups are supposed to assimilate into, and that people become, in this case, Brazilian through their endorsement or embrace of a particular outlook uh, and a set of cultural values within which uh, this idea of harmonious race relations is a component. The, um, the person who I'm going to use as uh, an example for this is uh, someone uh, many of you will be familiar with, the Brazilian writer Gilberto Freire, who is uh, the preeminent public intellectual of Brazil's 20th century. And I'm going to work through some of his writing as a way of illustrating some of these ideas. So an example of this concept of ethnic nationalism within the work that Gilberto Freire develops um, uh, would be the statement, there has never been among the Portuguese, nor is there among Brazilians, racial prejudice of any kind. Right? So that, that, that construction, right? There's never been among the Portuguese, uh, nor is there among Brazilians. Right? The subordinate role of Brazilians to a Portuguese identity. Right? This is the ethnic nationalist core of Gilberto Freire's writing, that all people in Brazil by being Brazilian, absorb a Portuguese cultural essence, which has specific implications for the system of race relations in Brazil. Uh, a different characterization, so that's a positive characterization, uh, one that everyone gets to be Portuguese by being Brazilian, and this means that they're also not racists. A negative con con construction along the same lines would be, uh, there rigorously does not exist in Brazil an African minority of any kind. In other words, it's not possible to have an identity that is outside of that dominant identity of being Portuguese. Uh, and therefore, the assertion of a separate experience of people of African descent uh, is un-Brazilian by Gilberto Freire's construction. Now, engaging in un-Brazilian acts right, in a country that is frequently ruled by a national security state is dangerous business, something that Gilberto Freire certainly seems very well aware of when he uses this kind of language. Okay, and racial populism, right? This is uh, a, a term that I've been uh, working with more and more uh, in the context of, or in place of a much more commonly used term that I find really challenging to use even if we're trying to analyze it or, de or deconstruct it, which is the concept of racial democracy, right? So if we uh, think about this idea of racial democracy in Brazil, this kind of dominant paradigm that Brazil is shaped by this kind of democratic coexistence between people of different races, right? This is, this is not true. It's no more true and no less true than really just about any place else, right? But it's the thing that's singled out in Brazil as, as, as a defining object of national character, right? Even at the moment of critiquing it, just by saying the words racial democracy, you give the term a kind of power, right? That then you find yourself kind of on the back end of trying to dismantle, right? So racial populism, I think, is a way of understanding and talking about racial democracy that doesn't give it that, that power against which you have to derive your, your critique. So racial populism, uh, I would define it as the act of uh, frequently a public figure, let's say now Vice President Hamilton Morau, of defining the experience of a racial minority group in terms that reinforce a national positive image. Uh, its representation of benign race relations uh, as a positive element of national identity has a couple of characteristics to it. First, it relies on generalizations and myths that are f uh, fed often by ethnic nationalism. Second, it relies on favorable comparisons to other countries. Again, let's put the United States and South Africa there as, as the foils or as the exceptions. Uh, third, it negates experiences to the contrary, right, that there can be no evidence, right, that demonstrates that it doesn't exist. To the contrary, evidence of racial discrimination is often used as a site to deny the existence of racial discrimination in Brazil. Uh, 
And uh, last, and as I suggested, this part is especially pernicious. It makes criticism of patterns of racial relations and discrimination in Brazil uh, something that is a threat to the nation itself, right? What Gilberto Freire calls anti-Brazilian. Uh, and you know what, what, what Freire will frequently do with this is to suggest that people who are engaged in uh, organizing around um, uh, black civil rights in Brazil are influenced by Russian Soviet communism. Um, they are uh, un-Brazilian agents, right? So he's essentially suggesting that any effort to challenge racial discrimination is an act of subversion, right? Uh, in a country with a long history of repression of what are constructed as acts of subversion. Uh, and many people who are engaging in these acts, in fact, uh, acts of, of racial mobilization in Brazil in the 20th century, especially the 1960s and the 1970s, are the subject of, of uh, frequently violent repression. So here I want to, to uh, juxtapose uh, Gilberto Freire, uh, seen here uh, on the left during uh, a visit to colonial Angola in the 1950s, uh, and uh, the book that is most commonly associated with these ideas, uh, Casa Grande Senzala, which is uh, a narrative uh, allegory about the cultural and social proximity between masters and slaves on, on plantations, which becomes a metaphor for the Brazilian nation. Uh, in which what he's doing are a couple of really important conceptual things, one of which is uh, suggesting that uh, Brazil is positively characterized by cultural and racial mixture between people of Portuguese and of African descent in this kind of uh, uh, plantation that is a metaphor for the nation. Uh, and the second thing that he's doing that's also very important, and he's, he's not the first person to do it, he's not the major person to do it, but he's the person who, who markets, it, markets it the best, is um, uh, makes the transition between thinking about race in Brazil as a state of nature to thinking of race in Brazil as uh, something that is a cultural construction, right? So from he, he, the, the pivot from scientific racism uh, to denying the idea of a biological or scientific difference between people of different uh, racial or ethnic origins. He's someone who popularizes that, that idea. And I put him alongside someone who is uh, a contemporary of his, a, a prominent uh, anthropologist and folklorist named Edison Carneiro, uh, whose book, O Quilombo de Palmares, uh, engages in uh, a uh, collection of oral histories of popular memory of a runaway slave rebellion in uh, 17th century Brazil. Right, so these are two very different kinds of works. Right? One's a top-down allegory about the nation. The other is a bottom-up effort to uh, construct an oral memory of a, tra tra a tradition of resistance. So, in Gilberto Freire's Casa Grande e Senzala, the masters uh, and the slaves, as it's translated uh, into English, there's what he and uh, interpreters of his work uh, suggest is the key passage. And I want to take this, this so-called key passage and unpack it to look at how some of these themes kind of play out within this formulation of racial and, and national identity. So, Here's, here's the passage, and I'll, uh, I'll read it to you. This is, again, Gilberto Freire in, uh, being fetid in, in uh, Angola in 1950. So he's writing about his experience uh, in uh, New York as a uh, master's student at Columbia University when in about 1920, based on the period of his study, uh, he describes in the introduction to Masters and Slaves in 1933. So now talking about writing in 1933 about something that he, he sees in 1920. He describes in 1920, um, seeing after more than three years absent from Brazil, a band of Brazilian sailors, mulatos and cafuzos, people who are of racially mixed background, right, of predominantly African descent, disembarking from, I don't recall if it was the Sao Paulo or from the Minas uh, through the soft Brooklyn snow. They gave me the impression, he writes, of being caricatures of men. Uh, it reminded me of a phrase from a book in English of an American traveler that I had just read about Brazil, quote, the fearfully mongrel aspect of the population. Miscegenation resulted in that. Uh, I lacked then what someone could have told me, like Raquette Pinto uh, told the 1929 Conference of Arianists that the individuals who I judged to represent Brazil were not simply mulatos or cafuzos, 
but sickly mulatos and kafuzos. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. And at the first level, what he's doing is he's suggesting this, uh, this transition in thought from seeing these sailors from being uh, racially degenerate to being in a state of degeneration caused by their uh, general conditions of health and hygiene. Right? Uh, now, if we just take that construction on its face, part of what's happening here is he's, he's simply transferring the terms of degeneracy. Right? Uh, at no point is he kind of respecting these people as individuals. Right? Uh, this is then the second the really significant thing. These aren't specific people with specific histories. These are symbols of a nation. Right? And they're symbols of a, of a sick nation in which, uh, by reinterpreting the, the reasons why these people um, don't please Gilberto Freire because of their appearance, right? he's changing the reasons why he's displeased. But the curious thing about this, this passage right, is the way in which he, he treats uh, these people who he de-individualizes, right? They're no longer these specific people who are disembarking from these particular ships, right? They're instead, you know, something that, rep that are a reflection of, of Brazil. And this is a, a curious choice talking specifically about sailors disembarking from ships called the Minas or the Sao Paulo. Uh, these aren't any ship. Uh, this, this, by the way, is the, is the Minas. These are um, the pride of the Brazilian Navy. Uh, these super expensive uh, British-built dreadnought warships, uh, which were uh, sort of white elephants, even at the moment they were commissioned at an extraordinary expense, but was, were intended to show uh, Brazil's prestige at the seas, especially vis-a-vis -vis Argentina, right? Uh, and uh, they were, so these, these are ships that are such a prominent, also part of Brazilian national identity that uh, Gilberto Freire can kind of casually refer to the ships as the Minas and the Sao Paulo in a way in which he, he infers that his readers will know exactly which ships he's thinking about, right? But not only are these ships the pride of the Brazilian Navy, they're also ships that are the site of uh, one of the major racial revolts of 20th century Brazil, something called the Revolta da Chibata, the Revolt of the Whip. Uh, shortly after the ships were commissioned and brought to Brazil, the sailors who were overwhelmingly black uh, engaged in uh, a strike uh, and mutiny against their officers, several of whom they kill, in order to end the practice of corporal punishment through whipping on the Brazilian Navy. Uh, now, these sailors, almost all of them black, uh, being whipped in a country that had only just abolished slavery and which with the abolition of slavery, corporal punishment, especially through whipping, had been rendered illegal, right? The fact that this practice continued in the Navy was talked about uh, as an extension of slavery by the sailors. And uh, ending this practice was something uh, that became the subject of this action, the revolt of the whip. The sailors uh, took the ships, uh, they, uh, they shelled the city, uh, there were civilian casualties in the shelling of the capital city of Rio. Uh, they, they killed several of the officers. Officers of other ships uh, took their ships to try to torpedo these kind of newly expensively acquired parts of the Brazilian Navy, but um, the officers didn't know how to operate the torpedoes, only the sailors did, and the sailors were rebelling, so that, that didn't work. Uh, what did work was uh, legislation to end corporal punishment in the Navy. Uh, followed by an amnesty for the sailors, followed by the sailors then being uh, arrested and dispersed to prison camps in remote parts of Brazil, uh, which ends the, uh, ends, the, ends the rebellion. So these, would, these sailors in uh, revolt in uh, 1910 would not have been the sailors that uh, Gilberto Freire uh, would, have been, would have seen, right? They had been suppressed, right? Uh, but that history by uh, these uh, sailors, um, recent forebearers on the Navy would certainly have been something that, that they would have understood. We would not understand this under, look, reading Gilberto Freire's allegory about the nation. So this is what I think is at stake in this idea of uh, racial populism, right, is that by turning people and their historical ideas into symbols about the nation, this is an ideological practice, right? And this kind of ideological practice is especially resistant to the production of evidence to the contrary, 
uh, and it's something that then lives within an entire uh, discursive structure about the nature of the relationship between race and ethnicity and the nation, right? The people who are kind of transacting this ideology uh, employ in uh, lots of kinds of ways. So with this, let's return to Brazil's Vice President uh, Hamilton Mourão. Uh, and here's the, uh, uh, the fuller context of his, um, of his statement uh, that he doesn't believe that racial prejudice exists in Brazil. I honestly don't see racial prejudice in Brazil. For 50 years, I belonged to an institution, the army, where it did not exist. During the Second World War, we were the only multi-ethnic division. The Americans had a division of only blacks, which was a problem. The English had, had troops of Indians, right? And so this, this is a formulation that has all the characteristics of what I'm describing, right? Um, he denies the existence of an entire category of experience that tens of millions of Brazilians could relate personal experience with, right? Uh, by virtue of uh, generalizations and myths that he brings from his experience in the army, right? He, he didn't serve in World War II, right? But the idea of a World War II multi-ethnic Brazil, right, is a very powerful idea in, uh, in the Brazilian army. Uh, one which, uh, when historian Uri Rosenheck interviews uh, veterans of the, um, uh, of the Second World War in Brazil, one of the things that they will frequently mention is their surprise at seeing the existence of segregated U.S. troops, uh, and in particular, the unwillingness of U.S. military hospitals to tr treat African-American soldiers who were wounded who were treated instead in, in Brazilian hospitals. So this made a real impression, right, upon uh, people in the Brazilian army, and it's an impression that has kind of culturally persisted in a way that becomes available to, uh, to Hamilton Mourão as he constructs this idea that racial prejudice does not exist. So here he engages in that, that generalization, then he engages in that positive uh, comparison with another country, in this case, the United States under segregation, uh, or um, uh, in England uh, under imperial rule. This isn't his first or only remark of the kind. Uh, the day that he was announced to be the vice presidential nominee, uh, he gave a, uh, an address at the um, chamber, uh, chamber of Commerce of a major industrial city in southern Brazil, Caxias do Sul, uh, in which uh, sitting at uh, a podium next to someone who is identified, who is described in the newspapers next to him as the first and only black um, city councilman of the city of Caxias do Sul, which is another construction that I'm skeptical of, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, this is what he says. Um, one of the things our government will do will end with the idea of um, people holding special privileges. This is uh, an Iberian inheritance, right? A construction in Latin America that's commonly used, Eranza Iberica, right? As uh, kind of this, this kind of negative legacy of colonial rule. Uh, and then he, con then he contextualizes the Eranza Iberica. Uh, we, also have a uh, we also have a heritage of, of indolence or laziness that comes from indigenous peoples. Um, uh, I'm indigenous, right? So at this moment, he, he seemingly catches himself and realizes this may not play well. So he now identifies with the people that he's been, he's, that he's insulted as a means of defusing what he realizes could become uh, understood as a, uh, as a racist insult. My, my father's Amazonian. Um, and, uh, and, and malandragem, right? This is a, a tough word to translate into English, but it means like uh, being a rascal or a ruffian, right? And it's a heavily racialized term in, in Brazil. Um, E malandraging, Edson Rosa. Edson Rosa is the, the councilman sitting next to him. Uh, malandraging, Edson Rosa, nothing against you, but that's uh, something that comes from the Africans. So this, this is our cultural melting pot. Right? Um, he's later kind of questioned about the nature of, of his remarks, and he defends himself. Não há nenhum tipo de racismo na minha declaração. Como eu mesmo disse, Eu também sou indígena, right? There was no racism in my remarks. As I myself said, I am indigenous. Right? So this, this creates a, a kind of challenge also for Edson Rosa, who now faces the burden of explaining why he sat there while being insulted by the person who's the vice presidential nominee of the political party that he's a part of, right? Uh, to which he responds, um, the person who needs to answer for his remarks is him. I, uh, I have felt in my flesh, uh, felt in my flesh, um, the nature of racial prejudice, right? So again, this is you know, personal experience, lived experience, uh, 
uh, versus, versus ideology. This then is, is, is the tension, right? The capacity uh, on the one hand for someone like Hamilton Morel uh, or others, many others like him, to engage in these kinds of ge generalizations of benign race relations. And on the other hand, the labor that is uh, just as abundant of carefully mapping and documenting specific patterns of uh, racial prejudice and discrimination in Brazil. So I just went back to Hamilton Morel's comments from the beginning of the talk. Let me go back to that 1950 article from the Correio, um, uh, Correio Paulistano uh, where the headline is, Prejudice Exists, right? This is, this is the opposite version of this, right? This is the assertion of the existence of racial prejudice, which in this case is based on uh, cited evidence. Um, in the interior of Brazil, uh, in the interior of Brazil, black people can't stay at hotels. Uh, in, uh, in many cities, they can't go to the barber shop, they can't go to restaurants. Um, in many cities, the kind of promenades where people would go in the first half of the 20th century to kind of uh, go for a paseo, go for a walk on the weekends, right, that these would be segregated. Um, here in Sao Paulo, uh, blacks can't enter the casinos, the nightclubs, um, and only occasionally can they get into restaurants. Um, you would, it, it would give you great trouble to find all the examples of this in the city. Uh, but for example, a Rua Direita, which is you know, kind of a major commercial boulevard, right? This is the street with all the kind of fancily dressed uh, uh, shop windows, right? Uh, on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, th this street offers a, um, an eloquent testament to this. Uh, these are the days in which the men and women of color, generally young, uh, go out together and kind of walk the street in the evening. Um, and uh, all of the stores and their windows are shut for this. Um, they are, um, uh, they are a testimony of what is uh, a strange lockout, right? And the term lockout is being used here in, in English, right? And so even, even that moment when you point to the existence of, of prejudice or discrimination, the use of the term lockout is you know, one of the ways in which ideas about segregation are being, are being brought from the United States. Right, so this, this labor of documenting the existence of, of discrimination Right, is something that uh, people will go sometimes to extraordinary lengths to be able to produce this counter-narrative, uh, as is the case of uh, Maria Elena Coimbra uh, at, the, uh, at the right in this photograph, uh, and two of her friends who were uh, turned away at the door of the studio nightclub in Jardins, Sao Paulo, kind of an affluent part of, uh, of Sao Paulo in 1985. Um, they, uh, after not being allowed in because, uh, because one of the, their guests is, is uh, someone who's black. Uh, they return uh, the next week to be turned away again. They're, they show up, they, they're very well dressed. Uh, they go to the door, they're not allowed in. Uh, they're accompanied this time by a reporter from the Foyle de Sao Paulo newspaper as well as the a photographer from the Foyle de Sao Paulo newspaper. And uh, one of them, I'm not sure who, has a small tape recorder in her pocket. Right? Uh, and they are, so what they're doing is they are producing documented evidence of the existence of, of, uh, of segregationist action at the entrance uh, to this nightclub. The nightclub owner defends himself by saying, I'm not racist at all, but my customers are. Right? Um, so this, uh, they take this case to court. Um, it goes to trial and the judge uh, issues his ruling uh, in the real ruling uh, he declares, no over segregation racial. There was no racial segregation. Uh, this practically does not exist in Brazil. Uh, and then he goes into a, a kind of a sexist kind of uh, uh, reflection here on how desirous uh, to all Brazilians, women of color, including women of Japanese descent are, right? As evidence that, that racism is, is not a factor that could be kind of legally adjudicated. Okay, so then just to, um, uh, to wrap it up, I want to come back to the, uh, the sailors on the ships, the Minas and the, and the Sao Paulo. Uh, this photo uh, and this photo, uh, I took them last week at a museum in Sao Paulo in the Parque Ibirapuera. This is the big central park in Sao Paulo. 
uh, at the Museo Afro Brasil. This is a museum uh, that's been open for about a decade uh, that's funded by the state government, uh, which is an extraordinary, uh, really fantastic collection about uh, Afro-Brazilian uh, culture, history, art, religion, labor. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's one of the kind of best constructed, best uh, interpreted museums uh, you're likely to see. At this moment, it's, it's in the risk of, of being closed. It's just been defunded by the state of Sao Paulo, right? And so that is, that's the tension that's afoot in Brazil right now, right? That step-by-step -step effort of documenting the histories of people is, at the moment, completely at risk, right? Uh, at the hands of people who negate the existence of the possibility that these individuals might have faced discrimination or prejudice, right? Again, uh, what these people mean as a symbol for the nation versus what people's histories are, right? Um, this is also a context where in Brazil, uh, over the course of the past 10 years, an extraordinary process has uh, taken place uh, in uh, Brazilian legislation and in Brazilian higher education in which uh, affirmative action and quota policies have been enacted in, in university admissions uh, across the country, across public universities, and in many cases in private universities. Now the law that uh, enacts these for federal universities uh, is a law that uh, was passed in 2011 with a 10 year lifespan, uh, which means that that law expires within the mandate of the current government which denies that racial discrimination exists. Right? So what do we do with this? One of the things that is clear in Brazil today is that, and Brazil has no monopoly in this area, right, is the realization that um, old and bad ideas or unfounded ideas, they don't go away, right? They're not vanquished by better data because they are nourished continuously by ideology. Um, so uh, that expectation, uh, however optimistic, is one that's not founded in the context of, uh, of contemporary events. But in the context of these events, what it does is it serves as a vivid reminder of the importance of that other kind of work, the work of uh, building people's histories from below, right? Of not feeding ideologies, but uh, exploring and interpreting uh, the experiences of people who have been historically marginalized or are historically invisible. Uh, people who, whose experiences don't fit uh, the ideologies uh, and narratives uh, that, are off, that often nurture uh, people who are in power. And so uh, it's for that reason in particular that I'm delighted to be with you over these next two days of the papers that are going to be presented, all of which are, are really creative, uh, carefully researched examples of building this kind of a history for below. And for that reason, uh, I think that we all have a lot to learn from each other in the coming days. Thank you very much, Jerry, for a fantastic opening to the uh, to this uh, conference, especially the conceptual breadth of the of the of your presentation. We have. We have um, time for a couple of questions before we continue. Anybody wants to? Yes, Ori Ari and Stefan. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, that was very thought-provoking. Um, two related questions. Um, and this notion that Brazil has, has had throughout history uh, what some call uh, lenient slavery, especially in comparison to the US, and more benign race relations, this notion appears in, in for example, travel literature that is written already in the beginning of the 19th century. And it is repeated, for example, by foreigners like Stefan Zweig. Uh, so my, my question here is how come? So how come that foreigners, foreign visitors, travelers, who don't have the same interests as those elites that reproduce these ideas and notions uh, ideologically driven, 
why do they make the, some similar opinions about Brazil? And mm. that leads me to the second question, which has to do with the work of your mentor, uh, Thomas Kidmore, um, which points out that, I mean, racial thinking in Brazil, racial discourse, which you have discussed, should be studied in terms of its relations to the actual race relations on the ground in the sense that, and, and for example, taking uh, the major fact into consideration that Brazil has a huge mulatto population. Again, in comparison to the US, it's, it's the internal uh, um, reference point. Um, and this is something you hardly discussed, trying to explain the why of this kind of discourse of racial democracy. So how about the actual um, situation on the ground, I mean, racial, racial mixture in higher percentages than in the US, for example, or in other mm -hmm. countries? Um, thanks. So uh, I think there's, so these are two questions then about, you know, what are, what are actual race relations like in different historical contexts, right? And how we, what are the data points we use to, uh, to interpret those? And uh, one difference, certainly in Brazil in the 19th century compared to other societies where slavery was still intensely practiced, right, was the, the presence of a large free black population, right? Uh, that was something that um, tended to increase in Brazil at the same degree as it was increasingly restricted in other countries, in particular in the early United States, where uh, in most of the US South, uh, it became increasingly uh, criminalized to manumit slaves right, in the early Republican era. So there is a kind of a counter, counter tendency there, right? And so to see a society in which there are people who are uh, black or of mixed ancestry, African or of mixed ancestry, who are in slavery but also not in slavery, is something that was an unusual sight within that Atlantic world of, of slavery. But the thing with uh, travelers and traveler's accounts that's really interesting and really significant is that uh, travelers are often bringing the, the gaze of their own society to the context that they're thinking about. Right? And uh, one example that I work with a lot is uh, African-American travelers to Brazil in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, in many cases, these African-American travelers going in the 1920s or the 1930s to Brazil are people who are journalists with the African-American press, right? Uh, and they are, uh, they frequently praise race relations in Brazil in comparison to their experience, uh, the experiences that they write about in the Pittsburgh Courier or the Chicago Defender, right? Uh, but when you read their accounts, the accounts are, are, the, the accounts are more complicated than the message that they're conveying, right? Uh, I got off the ship uh, and I had to spend two days trying to find a hotel, right? They write in an article where nonetheless they praise the nature of race relations in Brazil versus the United States. And so they're talking on the one hand about their lived experience with discrimination, but they're also imagining a Brazil that is a counterpoint to the United States. And that I think is the really important thing, right? Uh, the, the role that Brazil can play and that uh, Brazilian intellectuals really cultivate this role, right, as a uh, possible moral alternative to systems of social relations or, of ide or violent ideologies that are noxious to the people who are making the observations about Brazil. Stefan Zweig would be one example, but the, the multitude of African American travelers are the same, right, that for them, Brazil is, uh, an, em is emblematic of the possibility that the thing that is the thing now in the United States is not inevitable. But that is also, that's, a, that's, a commit, that's an ideological commitment to a national project outside of Brazil in which the reading of Brazil is also, I, I don't mean this as, as a judgment, but it's, it's like Hamilton Monau's experience, right? So there's an ideological project that's being nourished by a kind of a selective interpretation of the evidence, right? That again, departs from that, from that lived experience. Um, you, and then you mentioned this, this discussion of Thomas Skidmore's about the nature of uh, uh, pardo or mulatto multi-racial identities. You know, here the, the, um, 
the example that develops this even further is the work of Carl Degler, an American historian who writes a book uh, called uh, Neither Black Nor White, uh, in which he suggests that Brazilian race relations are more harmonious because of what he calls the mulatto escape hatch, the idea that uh, in Brazil uh, people can kind of opt out of the marginalization of blackness as they experience social mobility because they can adopt identities as being not black but brown, not brown but, but light brown, or even kind of passing as white. And uh, this, is a, this is a study that for several generations received, you know, kind of a lot of criticism because statistically it's, it's completely not true. Right? The data for socioeconomic uh, indicators like educational levels, um, uh, salary, race of uh, occupational mobility, uh, the difference is strictly between people who are white and people who are uh, preto y pardo. Right? The difference between uh, white and preto y pardo depends on the survey between, um, uh, in, in salaries, 40 to 60 percent for preto y pardo to, to white. The difference between preto y pardo is like 2 percent, right? So, so you're either white or you're not white, statistically speaking, right? So within, within any of the kind of major statistical data, there is no third category in Brazil. And yet that's a book that's being read in kind of interesting new ways in Brazil today, right? That, that in the cultural turn, uh, it's, it's not a book that works in terms of social history, right? That socioeconomically, this doesn't exist. But in the realm of uh, culture and perception, it does. The idea that there's a middle category, that idea does exist, and that idea does have a power. Right? And so the book is being read much more positively, but within that, within that other kind of frame. Ali? Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Ari Katsovich, Hebrew University. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for breaking stereotypes for those of us that thought that Brazil is there is no ethnic uh, racism, but my question actually you invited that, which is about your two definitions, right, of uh, ethnic nationalism and racial populism, because mm -hmm. I got a bit lost. Maybe you can clarify. I mean, ethnic nationalism, I wrote, it's like multi-ethnic Brazilian nationalism, uh, harmonious race relations, so that that's what I understood. And racial populism, you gave that like a positive sense, a positive element of national identity, like a racial democracy. So maybe you can clarify that because mm -hmm. my sound counterintuitive, if you think racial populism, I think something negative. Thanks. Sure. With, uh, um, thank you for the opportunity to expand on, on these concepts. And so with ethnic nationalism, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's two ways that we can think about it. One is the idea that the nation is the representation of, uh, is, is the expression of a single ethnic group's identity. Uh, but uh, another definition of ethnic nationalism, that's the one that fits in this case, is that uh, within the nation, uh, there may not necessarily be a dominant ethnic group. However, the capacity of other ethnic groups to assimilate into a set of uh, identity or cultural values of one group, that that, that is the, uh, that's the ethnic nationalist construction. So in this case, uh, Brazilian ethnic nationalism culturally Portuguese, right? Uh, the idea that people become Brazilian as they embrace Portuguese identity or Portuguese values, and that the most significant of these, this, for the purposes of the construction of national identity, the most significant Portuguese value is this uh, idea attributed to medieval Portuguese that because of their contact with people of Jewish and Arab North African descent, uh, that there's a degree of among Christian male Portuguese of the early modern era, a degree of um, racial tolerance and conviviality, which in the work of Gilberto Freire is also highly sexualized. Right? Uh, this, this becomes the, the kernel of uh, the idea that Brazil is uniquely characterized, characterized by, by racial mixture. And you know, there's something that I think is, is really remarkable about this because it's, this is at the core of uh, the Brazilian conception of, of kind of a national exceptionalism. And yet, uh, one of the things that Freire really doesn't do as he expounds for decades on this idea is to consider that uh, very similar things take place across the Iberian Peninsula and uh, within the other territories that are subjected to colonial systems under Iberian rule, right? So somehow this is different from Mexico or Argentina, that this is, this is specifically Brazil. This is, this is not something he explicates well. 
Uh, and so racial populism, um, thank you for the opportunity to, to qualify that because I, I don't mean this in a positive sense. Um, to, uh, to the contrary, what, uh, what I'm defining as racial populism is uh, the action that somebody takes to uh, treat the experience of a minority group, to interpret that minority group's experience as representative of positive national characteristics. Okay? So, uh, so, so this, is, this could be someone who's not a part of a group. It could be someone who kind of claims to be part of the group, like Hamilton Morau. Um, though I think if, if Hamilton Morau had, had, um, had, an, had an indigenous identity, his discourse about indigenous peoples might be different than the one that he has, right? Uh, but one of the things that he has in his position of kind of power and influence as a vice presidential candidate and a, a retired general is the ability to kind of assume the identity that befits the, the discourse that he wants to, to give, right? Uh, and in this case, he can um, make kind of essentialisms and generalizations about different peoples and their ethnicities and what these mean, and add these up into a statement that uh, Brazil is a great nation which is not characterized by, by racial discrimination. And so his ability to uh, uh, take a historical experience of people outside of his own and to characterize it as being a positive experience based on his kind of generalized or mythological impressions and to attribute these to a definition of the nation, that is what I'm working with. Positive and manipulation. Exactly. Okay. Right. And it's also a form of, of political demobilization, yeah. right? Uh, that, you know, one of the things that, that populism does that's very, pop, that's very powerful, right, is it, uh, is, it uh, is not a uh, political approach that invites a lot of dissent or debate, right? Uh, and so in this case, the inability to, the, the um, what would I call it? The, um, uh, um, the challenge that it creates for people to demonstrate the contrary, right? Or the way in which it delegitimates uh, opponents, right? By making them anti national, right? This is one of the other really critical parts to this. Last, <laughs> yeah. Stefan, last question of this session, please. Thank you, uh, Jerry. I really like your talk, and I, I think this idea of, of um, talking about uh, the racial dimension of populism uh, um, is perhaps might might be even even um, more fitting for this, right? Uh, because of course, populism is all about creating the the other, which is not belonging to to the in group, and so on. And 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 here we see. How uh, the racial factor is being is being used in a multi-ethnic society to also create these borders in order to let others not participate. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm wondering wh what do you think about the role of of historians and and academics in this game, so to say, in this discurs discursive game of um, creating these in and out groups, um, what role have they played, historians, within the Brazilian context so far? And are they all agreed on, um, you know, uh, overcoming the racial uh, populism that you've been talking about? Or is it rather that within the Brazilian context um, they share in this, in this belief? And the second question would, would be, how, how would that, uh, what you presented to us, work beyond Brazil? And of course, in Brazil also, we, we see that there are so many different uh, regions, ethnically different regions, some where the African percentage is much, much higher and other where the indigenous percentage is much, much higher. So is there, is there any, any idea of differentiation within this discourse within Brazil and, and how would it work beyond its borders? Mm. Sure. These are, uh, these are great questions. And so first the question about the Brazilian historiography. Uh, here there's two things that I would point to. Uh, the first one is that Brazilian historiography is, is really regionalist, right? Uh, that uh, people who are writing about national Brazilian history, right, are often more likely to be doing the kind of work that Gilberto Freire does, right? It's, it's not empirically grounded, and it's engaging, and it's it's uh, cultivating uh, 
ideological contexts that have a, a substantial publishing market, right? This is the thing that we need to understand about Gilberto Freire, is that Gilberto Freire is someone who exists and we talk about because he has readers, right? And his readers have a very particular kind of set of characteristics to them in the early part of the 20th century that shape the sorts of discourse that is marketable in Gilberto Freire's work. Uh, if we look at the, the kinds of regionalist approaches to the production of uh, historical uh, scholarship, or for that matter, the social sciences of race, here you would really juxtapose this with uh, what becomes known as the Sao Paulo School. Right? And the Sao Paulo School is, is both highly theoretically engaged in a Marxist framework, but also super empirical. Right? Uh, and so people doing work in this vein uh, are engaging in um, multiple kinds of uh, qualitative and quantitative data collection right? that uh, people engaging in this ideological work tend to shun. Now, being able to engage in that kind of work brings us back to these challenges that I mentioned at the beginning about interrupted political democracy. Access to historical sources, historical archives in Brazil is not something that has had a kind of a consistent open doors policy over the past 50 or 60 years. Uh, even if we just look at the documents that are in the process of legally being declassified uh, through the, uh, the work of the National Truth Commission and declassification uh, legislation in the aftermath of the military dictatorship, the range of categories of sources that are obviously not being declassified is, is extraordinary. Right? Many parts of the government simply refuse to abide by the, the, the letter of the law. Right? So there are there are major gaps in terms of the kinds of studies that one can do right, across multiple areas, and this is one of them. Um, an example of how this maps out, for instance, is that uh, some of the research I do on patterns of racial discrimination and racial mobilization in the 1970s relies on uh, surveys, uh, uh, surveillance by the political police uh, in the 1970s and the 1980s. The black movement was super infiltrated, and those states where the archives were preserved are places with very rich detail about the formation of black social movements in the 1970s. But some states don't have these records at all or don't have them available to, to the public. And so the gaps are, are considerable gaps. Uh, remind me of the other question? Well, with one minute. We discuss it in the coffee break. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.